Hello, uh, I'd like to thank the KCA and NYU for hosting this event today. And what I'd like to do is ask the panelists, to, the, the speakers to come back up to the front. Uh, we're gonna start some questions. So again, we have uh, William Huang, uh, Huang, who was the surgeon who spoke. Uh, Robert Alter, one of the medical oncologists, Janice Dutcher, and James Shea. And I'll start off with a, a few questions. Uh, one question to the, the surgeon is, uh, what do you do, uh, you mentioned the surveillance for patients with some of these small tumors. Um, is your approach similar in a patient, for example, who's 20 years old with a small three centimeter, under three centimeter tumor uh, versus someone who may be in their 70s or 80s? So that's an excellent question. I, I think uh, as a surgeon, when we see patients who come to us with a small tumor, we, we have to really take a look at two things, and this is a discussion I have with them, not just the tumor, but also the patient themselves. So, you know, it's unrealistic to think that uh, a patient with who's only in their 20s or 30s uh, would want to follow their tumor for the next 20, 30 years, waiting for it to grow to the point where we think it needs to be treated. Uh, and so often someone like that will tell them, well, you really should have this treated, but this is not an urgent issue, uh, and we can address this when it's appropriate for you. But that's frequently, for most people, almost immediately. I think for older patients who find out that they have this in, in, the, in the setting of a lot of other medical conditions, uh, they often uh, take more importance than this tiny little kidney tumor, and will probably you know, follow them every six months or so, or follow them with imaging that they're getting imaged for, for other reasons. And uh, only if there's uh, a demonstrable change in their tumor will we then say, you should probably consider having this treated. So it's on an individual basis that, that we follow tumors. And by no means uh, was, was I suggesting that in someone who's completely healthy and someone who has a normal life expectancy that we would necessarily watch tumors. Mm -hmm. But I, I think a good example is I had a lady who was pregnant uh, and so during her pregnancy, she had an ultrasound and found a kidney tumor, and we certainly waited till after she delivered before uh, treating her, her kidney tumor. Okay, thank you. And uh, some of the questions on uh, high-dose interleukin. So uh, Janice, you talked a little bit about the, the treatment, and patients have asked often, you know, how many cycles can I get? Can I get treated, you know, come in five days, 10, five, do I come back again? How often can you repeat these treatments? Well. I tend to, the, so you can repeat the cycles depending on the toxicity that people had previously. Um, what I always tell people is your body remembers because it is an immune activating drug, so your reaction to it the second time is going to be greater than the first time. So the first week, the second week you get usually fewer doses. And then the clinical trials say after three months you repeat it, but I tend to watch how things go before I will give another cycle and see, because there are people that I've only been able to give one two-week cycle to, and then they had other issues, like one woman developed a rotator cuff injury, which is pro-inflammatory, and I couldn't give her more IL-2, and over the course of a year, all of her lung nodules went away without any more treatment, because the body remembers, and she still had this immune reaction going. Other people um, will give more frequently and try to get like four cycles in and over the course of a year. It really depends on each individual person, and I think uh, Bob would agree because he gives a lot of IL-2 as well, that it's different for different people. I don't know if you want to make that comment. Um, first of all, we've, we've learned from Jan, so I didn't have to, so <laughs> that's the funny thing. Um, we, try to, um, <laughs> we, um, we try to abide by the guidelines that were predicted 20 years ago, but again, that was utilizing the tumor for training cells that we don't utilize anymore. So, I like to give the five, dose of five days of therapy. Obviously, I agree with Jen. You have to check it. Every patient deals with the therapies differently. And again, the great thing about the toxicity is that they are predictable and reversible. So I give them not the nine-day break. I give them the 16-day break. So I have to come in two weeks later. Mm -hmm. Then I wait for four weeks, scan them, see how they do. Uh, I'd like to ride on each individual course of therapy if they do well. Then when they can sort of promote a stable disease or better, I like to discuss with patients the potential benefit of not doing it again. Um, I find the maximum number of courses I've given is four courses, which is a lot of toxicity. 
Um, again, as one is telling the therapy less, we stop giving it. So I agree with Jen. A lot of times the therapy is just stopped and the patient says it's still devolved and beneficial. And you can get a lot of duration of uh, time between coming off IL-2 until you reinitiate the next therapy. So again, months is, is great. Years is fantastic. Mm -hmm. We do see that. I'd also like to say I have actually given booster, booster courses. Like people have gotten a course of IL-2 things got better and they were stable and go on and on and on and then maybe something starts to grow again and I've given it again and they've knocked it down again. So I think, you know, a lot of us, as he said, we don't just do what the book says. We kind of vary it with the patient and mm -hmm. kind of experiment a little bit along the way with success. So Jen, mm -hmm. I have one question. I'm very interested about the two kind of gases that you're talking about, the IL-2 and the cell. Which one, which kind of gas you like more? Which side of him? Yeah, the, you know, the bikini is in IL-2 and the cell, right? So right. you want to do combination. Those are all gases, right? So one is, so all products are Oh, put stepping on the gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's from that's you. That's what you mean by gases. You from you. <laughs> <laughs> the gas. The gas, right? okay. Um, well, you get higher response rate with IL-2. Mm -hmm. There were there are old data that Bob presented with high, very high doses of interferon where there are complete responders. I just, but the problem with interferon is you have to keep giving it. You know, it's three times a week forever, or for however long you can tolerate it. Whereas with IL-2, it's short and sweet. Yeah, you're in the hospital, you have toxicity, but when it's over, you're done. You know, you walk away from it. So I, I'm, I've i always been, and I probably always will be a proponent of IL-2, because okay. I just think it's, it's easy. The person goes back to a normal life. You know, interferon is like having the flu forever. People lose 30 pounds. How do you manage um, toxicities with these uh, newer agents like the TKIs and, and uh, Sutan, Pazopinib, uh, Everolimus, mTORs? Do you, uh, do you start patients on full doses initially? Um, you know, I've, I've seen a couple of patients that have come in and they were started on a full dose, they had some toxicity, and now they're off that drug onto the next drug. What do you recommend uh, for patients? So, um, That's for the oncologist on the panel. I, I treat the patient who has a disease. So mm -hmm. you have to know who your patient is first. Um, I, you know, we are seeing this disease happen in younger patients, so you do believe that they are more able to tolerate side effects, and I'd probably give them the standard doses that is recommended based upon the data that's been presented. And I think the data that's been presented is how we should all, uh, apply our therapies. The one variant that, that, that with that would be the sutin, so sumitinib, which as a standard dose, given uh, the typical 28 days milk, 14 days off, has been significantly toxic to patients, young and old. Um, and I've adjusted the therapies to rather giving 28 days in a row and 14 days off to 14 days in a row and seven days off. And there's data to allow us to believe that that is as tolerable, um, actually better tolerated, as well as as effective. So and that's the only change I've done. I really try to treat patients with the recommended doses um, except if the patient's functional performance status is poor and they start them as a 75% dose that escalates up. Um, I believe that it's easier to treat a patient and accept their dose and accept toxicity um, like when the focus is the cancer. So I like to have my patients believe that the focus should be them and then we can take care of the cancer at the same time. So for them to tolerate a dose, and if we feel as if they tolerate it very well, we can try to escalate it up without the impact that they believe that the most max dose is going to be, the only dose that's going to be effective. So I'd rather tell, I tell my patients, you are walking a marathon. So if you sort of take it day by day to eventually get to the finish line, it's much better than to do all your energy up front, have bad side effects of the therapy, then you have to slowly scale back. So I have no problem starting at a moderate dose and escalating to a full dose based upon the tolerability, but on patients who have a good functional performance status, we can treat them full dose. I would just like to say that after going through the clinical trials with these drugs at full doses, um, when I treat people off study, I actually tend to start low and build up um, because I just have found so many people will bolt from the toxicity if they have a really bad hand foot syndrome or really bad hypertension. They don't want to be on the drug anymore. And we saw that a lot in the adjuvant trial because it you know, had a different motivational level. But um, there's data now from Canada and from Europe of a two week on, one week off schedule for submitment that I think is far better tolerated. And that you can give at full dose. But if I'm gonna do the four week on, two, um, 
two weeks off, I tend to start one week at one dose and build up the next week and then build up. Because I, I just think the goal is to keep people on the drug, like you said, a marathon. And I think however you can do it to keep people you know, on treatment and doing well, the best way to, the better way to do it. I, I mean, there are some data suggesting 50 is better than 37.5, but you know, most people can't stay on 50. I, I think very few people can stay on 50 for a long period of time. So I think the goal is to keep people on the drug, keep them stable, keep the disease under control, and that has to be done in a way that they can continue to live their lives. Just I have to tell you one anecdote, which was a fellow that was taking serafinib for a while, and he had terrible diarrhea with it. And he was a golfer. And he basically said, if I can't golf, I don't live. So he basically, you know, and when people take oral drugs, they do what they want to do. They don't necessarily tell you. So he would just stop the drug, stop it in the night, stop it in the morning, go out and golf, and then start it again. You know? I mean, you got to be able to live. What about you? you? <laughs> I tend to start either... In Depends on the patient. So it depends on the patient. Depends on depends on their um, other conditions that they may have, blood pressure and so forth. Um, I tend to start at an intermediate dose and work my way up. Rarely do I start full dose um, and work my way down. And then it also depends on uh, also uh, uh, different ethnicities. So uh, you know, what I've anecdotally in my my practice, uh, I've seen that patients of Asian descent don't tolerate. Uh, these uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors so well, so I start at a lower dose and work my way up. Um, so you, it's art oh, of medicine. Me, yeah, so I only have a day a week, so I don't see that many. <laughs> but but, uh, but I do, I, you know, I do love my patients, so I pay attention to it. Um, so the, the idea is this, I, I think it depends. So for the, from a, an elderly patient, um, in the, for example, like 70s, 80s, and you don't want to give them full dose because you're just, you are going to knock down their performance where they will live, live miserable. So you can start with very, to me, like for those patients, I really start with very low. You know, like for those when they were start 200, to see whether they tolerate, you can pop to 400, and maybe not come to 600, really go up to that. You know, so, so it really depends on who the patient you are seeing. If it's a very, very young patient, like 40 some years old, I want to give him the most benefit. So I give him like full dose, like 50, and to see whether he can tolerate, and to see whether it's really working. If it's not, if it's working, that's great. And maybe if he's having trouble tolerating, I could start to reduce it. So that you can do either way. But it, I think it's very important to see what the patient wants and what the patient really expects. Um, and and uh, again, if you are dealing with clear cell kidney cancer, that's what we most deal with. Vaget is super important. Even the patient with sarcomatite or whatever, they progress on sunitinib or fizotinib, they it slow down their disease. So you can see that they progress based on radiographically, of course, but they feel better. But the problem is really taking them off, boom, gone. So that, that's, you have to understand the disease. That's why the mechanism is important. It's not because they take up other things, it's just because they, on top of it, learn something else. So vaginal treatment always needs to be in your mind for clear cell kidney. So James, in your half day clinic, you know I've not become a they're very, very long. No, they're you know, they're long yeah, half I like days. I talk too to, too long, <laughs> so that now I become like a whole day. But no, no, it's fun. It's fun. That's not painful because that's the, the day that I enjoy it most. <laughs> I so I, I know that we are still, uh, you know, we we still treat patients um, same size fits all. You know, yeah. we're giving everyone the same agents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what can patients do? to learn more about the genomics or metabolomics of their disease? Yeah, so, so I would say that, that don't, don't try to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> because even, even, think about it, if you ask your doctor, no, none of them know. If you can ask them, do they know about it? The, you, you can spend $10,000 to sequence it. Do they know it? Do they know how to deal with it? No, they don't. So basically it's a waste. At this moment, that if you know, so so to me, it's really you know, people need to really try to learn more. You know, of course, I'm not saying spend, don't spend the money. You should spend the money, and the, because time is more important than money, they just spend it and then get all the data. And then we can start to learn what's really going on. Uh, and the best way to learn it is, it, it's as I, as I said that you know how long you want to survey your patient. 
like you want to survey 20 years, whatever, it, it doesn't make sense. If you take, you know, we have a study that was very nice that if you take a tumor and you sequence like five or six regions and then combine them and just sequence once, and you find that if you don't find any bad, you know, like FEB1 or CD2 mutation, I don't think you need to follow your patient that frequent. A couple, two years may be sufficient. But if they have some other mutation, like FEB1 mutation or CD2 mutation, then you have to be very careful about it. Okay, so that's the way you should think about it. And if, for you know, you have, you, the clear cell is very simple. Clear cell is just a VHL disease. On top of there are something else. And that's how we start to learn what other gene may be at play, and that's what a, where the convergence is. And then if you treat it with two drugs or three drugs, blocking a different, you know, they, you know, converge, they have different conversion points. If you find out those conversion points on a very specific disease, maybe you can get rid of them. Because if you're doing one, you block into one, it's so easy to get to another way to converge a second point. So the easiest way is to you know, block two or three. If you can do that um, uh, successfully, you may actually get rid of the disease before they get every chance to build a resistance. But it takes time to gonna understand how it's actually evolved. Every disease is different. Even every individual patient is different. So, so and then nowadays you do sequencing, and the sequencing, yeah, it depends where you sequence. You sequence the primary, it's not going to be the same as you sequence the metastasis. So if I, if you guys, anyone want to sequence your tumor, and if you have metastatic disease, sequence the metastasis. Don't waste your time on sequencing the primary, because that's, could, that may not be the cause actually cause your problem. That's just part of the game. So anyway, so I, I don't I don't think this is a very good answer, but <laughs> the problem is really people spend so much money and really don't you know. It's and you mean things like foundation medicine, these types of. Uh, yes, yeah, no, no. So the idea is basically they need to get a very very big number and really really need clinical annotated, and really try to understand which disease is doing what. And that's why we kind of work with, with Novartis is kind of one of the things where we can do that is basically a big clinical trial. Um, and then we collect all the DNA, we collect everything. Because the, the reason DNA is easier to analyze is DNA is not, you know, so stable, millions of years, you know. That's why you can sequence dinosaurs to know what kind of DNA they have. And that, you, by sequencing that, you can try to kind of not correlate clinical response. And then you can figure out who will do well, who will not do well, who will respond to them, who will not. And based on that, in the future, you should be able to collect the patient who have that kind of mutation and should be treated what way. And we're gonna see some of that information over the next few years from the adjuvant trials, mm -hmm. or from several of the adjuvant trials, because I think they've all collected tissue. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the one that was sponsored by the MCI, the ECOG, Akron Cooperative Group, multi-center group, um, they actually allowed clear cell with other histologic associated types. So there's going to be a lot of information, but I think, you know, what what we're saying here, it's just not ready for prime time. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because what you're saying also goes all the way down to the disease state that I see, which is localized yeah, kidney tumors. People, a lot of urology. people often say, well, you know what, why are you operating on me? Shouldn't you biopsy this? Shouldn't you see what it is before you take it out? And the problem is that unlike some other cancers, biopsying it isn't really telling us that much yet. And we are not good, enough. we don't have enough information from a biopsy at this point to really say to you, oh well, this is a two centimeter tumor, you can watch it for the rest of your life. This is a two centimeter tumor and this is going to rapidly progress and metastasize. So until we have that ability, you know, we, we, we sort of use uh, really uh, rudimentary instruments. How big is it? You know, is it anywhere else? Things like that. It, it, it's, it's interesting, and I think also with the follow-up imaging for patients who are theoretically free of disease, uh, you want to be able to tease out who's going to recur uh, and, and who, who's going to uh, need additional therapy. And until you know we're more advanced with uh, figuring that out, it's just one size fits all. You image everybody, and you image everybody regularly, and you spend the healthcare dollars on that. So I can keep asking a million questions, but I'm going to go ahead and open it to the audience. If anyone has any questions, anything, it doesn't have to be related to what we've talked about, anything with kidney cancer or cancer in general. Maybe I should sit there, I will ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, actually, since uh, 
Uh, let me ask a question as a surgeon. I'm not a medical oncologist, obviously. With all these different TKIs now, what is what do most people use as their first uh, drug of choice now that uh, you know uh, with Nixnib and Zofanib and whatnot? Uh, is is there a, a favorite amongst you, or is it sort of? Uh, and what do you do to choose which drug to start mm -hmm. taking? So, I, so I would have to say for me, uh, I separate the standard therapies. Uh, and the clinical trials. So I try to encourage patients to enroll in clinical trials, especially since a lot of the new immuno, uh, immunotherapies are available only via clinical trials. I'll try to encourage patients to uh, seek out clinical trials either, either at my institution or other institutions. Uh, many of these clinical trials uh, with the checkpoint inhibitors that, that uh, the panelists spoke about are um, uh, comparison studies. So they have the checkpoint inhibitor nivolumab, for example, versus one of the standards, Sutent, or the checkpoint inhibitor versus another standard. So you have an opportunity uh, to get a, a drug that may, you know, may or may not be better than the actual standard. Uh, short of a clinical trial, if patients unable to go on a clinical trial, it depends on, you know, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Alter talked about, the, the prognostic factors of that patient. So. Uh, in a patient who has poor risk disease, you know, unwell person, I, I tend to choose temsorolimus. Um, in uh, a patient with good or intermediate risk, again, this is, uh, it's one size kind of fits all, um, I'm using one of the TKIs uh, of either Votriant or, or Sutent. So, um, depends on the, the, the patient, so I can give you some, uh, depends a lot on the patient and what they do. So I've had, uh, for example, some athletes or musicians who are very concerned about the hand-foot syndrome, the painful calluses that may uh, that occur more often in, in uh, patients that take sunitinib. So in, th in that case, I would use the Votrans instead. Um, conversely, in patients, for example, who I know have abnormal liver function test abnormalities or um, issues with their liver, we tend to see more abnormalities in, in those liver studies uh, in patients who take Votrin, so I would stray away from that. So it, uh, it varies. Uh, any, any patient with a, a non-clear cell, I'm talking about clinical trials. Um, so that's how, that's how I choose. Um, so, uh, okay, so uh, almost uh, two years ago, uh, there was a, a, a clinical trial that compared the two common drugs, uh, the two active drugs that we use for clear cell kidney cancer, and that was uh, Voltrient, Opazotinib, and Sutin or Sunitinib. And fearful of the toxicities of Sutin, there was a, a drug, Voltrient, that got FDA approved, and they went right on to a clinical trial and comparing the challenger, that being Voltrient, to the champion, that being Sutin. And um, a lot of centers were involved. Uh, it's a international study, and the data pretty much showed that the drugs were similar in how effective they were against the patient, but the tolerability of Votrans was uh, superior. Um, based upon that, there still is habit forming, where a lot of physicians believe that Sutin was the end-all, be-all drug. Where therapies were, um, again, we've been using this drug since early 2006, um, with very good uh, results, and based upon the uh, responses patients have had, it's very hard to sort of knock off the champion coming in with a newer drug. Um, we always take the patient's uh, quality by functional goals when it comes down to therapy. A lot of times, Votrin will be an excellent option for patients because the tolerability is, uh, again, deemed to be superior, not based upon a clinical trial. There's also another study where it was a patient survey where actually patients were exposed to both drugs in different sequences and patients uh, gave a diary and they submitted their thoughts what was the better agent. Again, they were not knowing what they were taking. 
and the patients by a 71 to 20 percent uh, margin believe that Vulcan was a better tolerated drug. So taking that into account, I like to look at these therapies as, you know, there's the patient and there's the, the, the disease. And patients who have volume of disease that I believe needs shrinkage faster, I think a tumor tinder for is a better drug to start with. Again, we have learned to adapt the dosing of it to make it much more tolerable because that was not presented on the, or I should say, that was not represented on the clinical trial comparing the two drugs. So I would still believe Sumindib is a great drug to use in patients with volumes of disease, patients where you're trying to adapt more towards their quality of life and the recognition that we're trying to slow down the disease or stabilize the disease, as Dr. Dutcher said. Stable disease is an accomplishment that we try to achieve as medical oncologists. Uh, patients, of course, want shrinkage and disappearance. So we always, again, have to explain the goals, but I tend to look at the patient, again, if the patient has good functional performance status and they have bulky disease, I think that a drug that can reduce that is important. And patients who have non-threatening disease, and I believe this is, again, that walking the marathon approach, I think Vulcan is an excellent option. Okay, I, I would also say that a lot, it depends on where you're being treated. If you're treating it in, being treated in a place that has a lot of kidney cancer, and the staff and the doctors, are, the nursing staff and the doctors are very familiar with the drug, you know, you're going to get um, a lot of help taking the drug. If you're not in a place where that's the case, but your physician is, feels comfortable giving this drug, it's more important that you get the drug that that physician knows the best. Because it's, you know, a lot, this is outpatient treatment. There's a lot of coaching that goes on. The nursing staff have to be tuned in, and you have to feel comfortable that you can call somebody whenever you need to, because there are things that come up along the way. So. I think familiarity with the drug and the toxicities and the management is key to giving the drug successfully and to taking the drug successfully um, uh, on the part of the patient. So I, I think, again, that you need to know what you're comfortable doing. I will say in that my only quibble with that study that was the comparison was that the quality of life questionnaires were timed to hit Sutend at its worst. Um, After because four it was weeks. right before the break. <laughs> so I, I always am a little skeptical about that. But, but otherwise, um, I, I understand the data. And I still, um, I've actually had more success with submitment than I have had with Vulcan. So I think we all have, it's the, it's the blind men and the elephant. We all have a piece of the picture. And, you know, again, it's our, our comfort zone in terms of what we can ask patients to do. Is it better to wait and see, given that the landscape seems to be changing so much, um, just trying to understand, like, is it, you know, the, the sequence or something? I think clinical trial, if you can access to a big clinical center, clinical trial will be the way to go. Because uh, now all the clinical trials head to head compared to standard of care. In the past, Clinical trial is like, you know, we don't have this, we don't have that, that's, we don't know where it works, that's why we're just throwing everything. But now the clinical trial, at least in kidney cancer, they are all very, very reasonably designed. And we really need to, un we really understand what's really going on. That's why a lot of treatment, the phase one, the phase three trials or, or, or the frontline trial is always, you had to talk about, you compare with Sutan, with, you know, some of the trials, Sutan with PD-1, with PD-1 plus Avastin and, and things like that. And those are the, you're building the composition of immunotherapy and try to figure out what's really going on. If you don't have the access, I would still depend on how, you, how fast your disease progress. You really don't want to wait. I have some patient with, oh, I'm so slow when it comes to the brain. <laughs> when you go to the brain, go to other places. And the other thing you have to understand is continue when it gets bigger, it continues to evolve. So you don't want to get it too big because it will evolve. They will acquire some other bad mutation. And that's when they took off. When they take off, you are dealing with different monster. 
Well, the, there are people where it doesn't take off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But this, so the small ones, this yeah. one, the small one, you monitor them. Yeah. If they only one <laughs> centimeter, two, you know, a, a, I have some patients that I don't treat for two years because right. their disease just don't do anything. But you have to understand. Ten years. Ten years. Yeah, years. but you have to understand the biology. Well, so that you know what I always say is get two points on the curve at least and see how fast, mm -hmm. especially somebody that is late recurrent, where you know that things have been quiet for yep. a long period of time. There are other people where every scan it's a little mm -hmm. bit bigger, it's a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Well, yep. you know, and there's some people where the next scan it's a lot bigger. Well, those people are not going to respond to immunotherapy, at least not up front. Mm -hmm. You may have to calm it down with a TKI, shrink it, as Bob was saying, and and make sure that it's under control, and then consider giving the immunotherapy. The sequencing is still tricky. I mean, we still don't understand it yet. I mean, there were data early on that if you gave interleukin right after a TKI, you would have some toxicities that were unexpected. But part of that was that gave it a little too soon after the TKI. You need to take a couple of months break, and then you can go on with the immunotherapy. So what I always tell people is you're gonna need all of the drugs. Once you start on drugs, you're going to need all of the drugs. So just, you know, but we don't really truthfully know the best sequence. And so it's still judgment. It's still what we call clinical judgment. Somebody's going slowly and they've had a long hiatus, I would go with immunotherapy. If somebody's got disease that came back in six months, you could try immunotherapy or you could say, well, maybe we should just go in with the targeted TK. Um, but, you know, there's no, and, and, you know, worrying about the mutations because once they start to grow, they really can grow. That's another, that's another subcategory. It's, I guess the big thing is it's not all one disease. And each individual person is going to have their own pattern. And what we do as a doctor is try to figure out what the pattern is so that we can give you the best. What, what about in that patient uh, that has that long hiatus, 2001 nephrectomy, and then now has, you know, 2015 small lung nodules, maybe the biggest is two centimeters, a small right renal mass. They've already had a partial nephrectomy, by the way, in 2008. What do you do for that patient? Do you go in, resect, do we ablate, do we start treatment? What's their renal function? Normal. Would you go after that one for them? Or would you try systemic first? You know, I, so th there's a couple things that have been proven in retrospective studies just to make a difference. I think some of the things that you brought out are very important to look at. One is, what was the duration of time between which uh, the person developed a recurrence? And so, you know, we've had success in patients who have six, seven years, and they develop a solitary recurrence and just removing it. And I have a few patients where literally every three or four years, I go back in and take a little something else out. But that's, uh, that's the biology of the disease. It's not really us being successful surgeons or clinicians treating them successfully. It's really that this is how their disease sort of putters along. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're talking about someone that, who has lung nets and then a renal lesion as well, uh, it, it, you know, the more disease burden there is in multiple places, the less enthusiastic I am to try to go and pluck everything out or send them to an orthopedic oncologist or send them to a, a Brain might be different, you'd obviously treat that, but you know, it, it, it really depends on how long it took to come back and I think what the, the volume of disease is. And I, again, also the one thing also is to get multiple points. So you, know, you see one thing six, six months or six years later, and then you scan them again after three months just to watch it and now it's everywhere. Clearly going in to take that out would be a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I sort of take the a little bit more aggressive approach in terms of surgery because I, at, at this moment I believe if you have limited disease, surgery may be the only bet that you have at this moment unless you really develop some way to cure the disease. If the prognosis of the patient is very, very well, it's really limited if the surgeon is very, very competent. So this way, where you get your surgery done and where do you get things done is very, very important. If lots of, some of my patients that, uh, you know, have this recurrence, uh, it's just like some of the patients you talk about that, um, that had disease like 10 years ago, now has lymph node recurrence plus lung recurrence maybe um, and, and the question is whether you want, what do you want to do with it so it really depends on the patient what you know what whether how aggressive they want how their performance status they have and whether they want to get what they want. so the patient I've had the two of them or three of them can just operate it and they are fine so so it really depends on on the course you know and of course you have some patient you operate no matter how you operate three months later something 
have anything. Mm -hmm. And that, those are patients that then not going to be a very good surgical candidate. So they just recur like after three months mm -hmm. or so. Yes. I just had a question about sequencing again, and um, might sound like an obvious question, but is there any thinking behind if you give one drug before another, does that um, necessarily prevent you from taking? So the question is, is, um, is it detrimental to take one sequence versus the other, or taking a certain sequence uh, will prevent you from being able to get another drug? So I would imagine something like, um, maybe like if you get a TKI and then an mTOR, uh, like sunitinib and then everolimus, mm -hmm. does this mean that you, and you progress on the sunitinib, does this mean you can't come back to another drug within the family of, of uh, sunitinib? Either that or, or even another class of drugs. Are, mm -hmm. are, you, are you no longer, you know, are those other options no longer available to you? So I, it doesn't limit, uh, as far as we know, it doesn't limit the, your ability to get other, or, or the, you, so patients can respond and can develop stable disease, and one of our panels later today will talk to you. He's on his seventh agent, some of which have been TKI, some of which have been mTOR, some of which have been experimental drugs, and has been on the current drug for many years now, a uh, similar drug to the initial drug that he started on. But on the other hand, if you um, mm -hmm. have disease that's been stable or quiet and then develop metastatic disease, Again, with that long hiatus, my preference, my bias is to give immunotherapy okay. because you've demonstrated a long period of time and then you have disease that's not growing quickly. My concern with starting with the TKI and then going to an mTOR is that every time you change, it usually means there's been something changing with the disease, depending on what your threshold is to change drugs. And a person might miss their opportunity to get at least get IL-2 mm -hmm. at this point in time because performance status is key to tolerating the drug and to responding to the drug. It means your immune system still is cooking. Now that may or may not be the situation with the checkpoint inhibitors, we don't know, because a lot of those people have had prior treatment. We don't know whether you, the performance status is as much of an issue, but in the IL-2, it seems to be sort of a surrogate for being in good immunological shape. And just back to your patient, you know, one thing that might be a consideration, that, that situation that you hypothesized, um, I would be nervous about doing more surgery on a kidney that's already had a partial nephrectomy mm -hmm. when they have other sites of disease, but they might be a candidate for something like cryo mm -hmm. or RFA to the kidney and systemic treatment to the lung nodules, and I still would prefer in, uh, in some type of immunotherapy in that mm -hmm. situation. And there's data, actually, that's what I want to say. There's data in animals, and I think now uh, Brendan Kirby in Portland is doing a study of radiation basically serving as an antigen release and then giving interleukin-2 afterwards as sort of a vaccination and then hydrocyl-2. In animals, it's, it has a profound effect. It really it has a remarkable effect on tumor shrinkage. We don't have any data in people. Mm -hmm. So that's the radiation to the To the tumor. Well, to the kidney.
So that, that, that's, that's not a rule by, by any means. And I think it has a lot to do with the comfort of the surgeon. Um, you know, there's, you may have heard the word VHL passed out to multiple times. You know, these people who have VHL syndrome will develop kidney tumors repeatedly throughout their lives. And so uh, many of them end up getting their kidneys operated on three, four, five times in the same kidney. So uh, a lot of it has to do with wh where the recurrence is located, for instance, and also with, um, uh, with the comfort level of the surgeon. But it's not a rule that once you've operated on it that you won't have it. I think the issue is if it's your only kidney, the likelihood that something could go awry during a repeat or redo partial nephrectomy uh, is greater, and the possibility that you end up losing the entire kidney is higher. And in that case, that could leave you possibly with no kidneys on dialysis, which for some people may be a situation that's worse than having you know, a, a solitary or, or a small growing tumor. Now, we are looking into other alternatives rather than removing it or going in and cutting it out, ablating it, freezing it. And, you know, uh, the use of that is very different than what I was describing in my talk about someone who has two functioning kidneys and a small renal mass. Uh, you know, your, your particular situation is different. You know, you had a recurrence, you already had a, an operation on it. And in that case, ablating it may be very reasonable. Uh, but that's really up to the comfort level of the surgeon. And also, I think part of it's where the tumor recurrence is located. And also what the, you know, the person's kidney function is, is going to come, come into play here. Yes. I think we have one, more, one more question. Okay. Um, and I just want to say, I'm not going to cut everybody off. We'll take one more question now, and then we'll break for lunch. And then um, there are um, the session after lunch. Mm -hmm. There will be lots of opportunity for questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, Dr. Wong, you mentioned in your opening presentation that uh, most of the <coughs> cases of kidney cancers are incidental. And, uh, they just happen to be found in CT or some other kind of uh, scan. And uh, I was just wondering, does it uh, make any sense to also focus efforts on uh, better screening methods to find this, uh, these kind of cases earlier on, instead of there's a hope of perhaps improving the survival of the overall system as well? Sure. Well, uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that we don't screen for kidney cancer. So, uh, you know, and th th that's a whole other topic, but to screen, you really have to fulfill certain criteria. And one is not just finding every cancer, but also making a, making a meaningful difference by screening and also having treatments that are acceptable and doesn't result in more harm than, than good. And I think, you know, you always hear about that in the news about breast and prostate and perhaps the downsides of screening. But... With, with kidney cancer, the bottom line is we don't screen. And I think that because of how frequently people are, are imaged nowadays, uh, it's, a, it's almost like a pseudo screening. They're, they're actually being screened without knowing it. Uh, we do screen for people who have hereditary diseases that may be, you know, predispose them to kidney cancer, but it's not a disease that we screen. So there's really nothing that we are interested in doing right now to try to find kidney cancer, if, if that makes any sense. I, I think having having said that, I would encourage uh, everyone here and, and your family members to see their doctors at least once a year, have complete blood counts, uh, have your analysis looking for blood in the urine. These are simple tests that can be done that can detect these uh, malignancies as well. You know, in 1980, they did a study for patients uh, who developed lung cancer. They thought that it wouldn't be ideal to screen all smokers and get them x-rays. And they calculated that the amount of x-rays uh, it would take to find one lung cancer is 170,000 x-rays. And they said that it was probably not financially worth it. Well, just recently they approved on patients who have smoking to do CAT scans and screen for lung cancer that just discussed at the oncology meeting this past year. So 30 years later, they find that screening the right patient population may be beneficial. There are so many different risk factors for kidney cancer and so vast. But there is also nominal risk factors and no risk factors for people who have kidney cancer for no reason whatsoever. So who is the right person to screen? And I agree with Dr. Molina. You know, the simple urine test may detect a small microscopic trace of blood in the urine that you would never see for years upon years if the doctor may find it. So that would probably be the best screening kind of routine doctor checkup at least once a year. Okay, thank you.